You know, I was, when I was approached by Chris Nowinski with the Sports Legacy Institute, and um, he had gotten the first uh, individual player that had retired, that had died to donate his brain, I think it was to Pittsburgh, for the first uh, autopsy. And I looked at it, and he said, what do you think? And I said, you know, you really need a card-carrying group of people to look at these brains. You just can't do this hap haphazardly. And so um, McKee at Boston, who I knew uh, professionally, not personally, but I knew of her work. Um, and people like Gay, uh, Guy Clifton at the University of uh, at, uh, Baylor, outstanding neuropathologists. And David Graham, who's since retired, was a great neuropathologist at Glasgow, where the Glasgow Coma Score was developed. So these are the people that need to look at these brains. Um, so, um, What's happening is that as these individuals are dying, and they're dying from all kinds of different problems, and some of them are self-inflicted wounds um, from suicides, they're beginning to see lots of different pathology. And yes, it is, it is a selected group of people. These aren't the people that, um, these, these aren't the people that are usually doing very, very well. These are the people that are doing very poorly. So it may be a select, population. But I am very, I'm very convinced with the quality of the type of, of um, histology that they're doing and the type of immunohistochemistry that they're doing, I think, I, at least from the papers that I've read. I have not visited their facility and I haven't seen how they actually section the brains or if there's any bias in how they actually do this. But I, I'm very convinced of the quality of their work and I think that this is a real phenomenon. We've known for many years that after um, head injury, the brain will atrophy. The tra traumatic cerebral encephalopathy is real. A person that has had a head injury when they were 20, and we uh, do a scan, a brain scan of them when they're 45, their brain looks like they're 80 in terms of its, sh its shrinkage. So I don't need a fancy immunohistochemistry technique to tell you that this is change. there's a change going on. So that, I think that's real. Uh, whether that applies to repeat mild concussions or what we were discussing earlier, if there is such a thing as a subconcussive repeat head injury, I don't know. But I am very, um, very concerned uh, uh, about that data, not so much from the sense of, it, of its quality or whether it's real or not, but the implications that it has. Um, I remember I was being interviewed by Alan Schwartz for the New York Times, and he says, um, when we were discussing this, he says, I, I hear this resistance in your voice. And I said, I don't want this to be true. I, I don't want this to be true. This, this is horrible if this is true. And if, it's, if it happens to everybody, I mean, this is, this is really a much greater cost than what I thought we had at the beginning. And I think we'll have to wait to see as, as um, uh, more, uh, more specimens come in. The military now is, uh, the, um, many of the individuals that are part of the, DO, not part of the DOD, but the part of the veterans that have come back, have agreed to donate their brains for analysis. So maybe as, as things evolve, we'll, we'll learn more about this. Um, I always, uh, I'm always impressed with, um, when I was younger, I was studied a phenomenon called cerebral hemispherectomy. Of course, you would remove half of the brain in children when they had bad seizures. And these kids grow up, they go to school, they go to college, they run hospitals, they become lawyers. And you know, you can all, it's always funny because you can always say, well, you really only need half a brain to do none of this stuff. And I, I, I raise that uh, example, not so much that it's related to traumatic brain injury, but that you can perform quite a, quite a lot probably with losing some atrophy. I mean, my, my father, who's still alive, has a lot of atrophy, but he's still very cognizant and can do quite a lot. He can't do the same thing he did when he was 60, but um, and he's now 88, but uh, there's a lot of capacity there and he can still enjoy life. But what I'm seeing out of, out of the Boston group is um, particularly some of the most recent work that uh, link, that we've, we've always known there's been sort of a relationship to uh, dementia and to Alzheimer's disease. 
We now know that there's a, there's a relationship to Parkinson's disease. Head injury doesn't cause Parkinson's disease per se, but it sets the brain up to be more susceptible to Parkinson's disease. The same way it sets the brain up for uh, post-traumatic stress. It sort of sets the brain up for that. The most recent paper that I saw that came out had it with amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. That's a, low, that's a motor neuron specific problem. That was remarkable. And um, it's only one report, but that has me very nervous. <laughs>